Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, gonna fight a little bit of technical difficulties. I think the battery actually might be running low. Uh, we'll just go with it and see if it works. Um, it's good to be with you. Uh, it's been a little while. Um, I think uh, I think it's been since December last year uh, that we've been back. But it's so good to be with you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, to get up and speak this morning, um, and hopefully it's not to the chagrin of too many in the audience to have to listen to me um, yet again. But I ask you to open up your Bibles this morning with me to Galatians chapter 3. And I'd like to use that as kind of a launching point for what we're going to speak about this morning. And if you look at verse 26 from what Luke just read, I want to thank Luke for reading that. What we find is a description of really what the Danville Church of Christ is, of what the Dulles Church of Christ is, of what the church as a whole is. And what we find is, is Christ giving us a description there in verse 26 via Paul, and it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free man, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to call us Abraham's descendants, heirs to promise. And so what I'd like to look at this morning is this idea of what are we? What is the church? Are we this group of like-minded individuals that just meets in this social setting on a regular basis? Are we no more than an earthly cult or club? Or are we instead what Paul describes us as here? Sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Heirs to promise. Fellow heirs to promise. We're family. First and foremost, above all, we are the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God who are a family because of what Christ has done. That is who we are. That's what we are. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be a family, to live like a family? How do we act in such a way to aspire to be, you know, those people described in 1 Peter 3, which is, or 1 Peter 1, which says that you were formerly not a people, but now you are the people of God. That we have become something set apart. A holy nation, a family, in the eyes of God. And so what does that mean? First and foremost, what we have to understand is that in order to be this family, it's going to require each and every one of us to become a friend to those in need. If you look in Acts chapter 9, we look at the fledgling church there, and we see that we have just had a turning point in Scripture. We've had the conversion of Saul, who is now Paul, and we see him in the latter part of Acts 9 as he begins to try to pursue the work of God. In Acts 9 and verse 26, we begin, it says, And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple, but Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. This can be a point in Scripture that we gloss over, and we can continue just press on towards the larger narrative, or we can focus in and look at what Barnabas is doing. What Barnabas is doing for Paul here in this instance is that he's taking him in. He sees a man with passion. He sees a man with drive to serve God. He's had this clear interaction, this face-to-face -face encounter with the Savior, and he looks upon this man with this fledgling faith who's being pushed away by other brothers and sisters in Christ. And instead, he chooses to put his arm around him. We have to be willing to go and find out and be that friend, be that Barnabas to those in need. So often what we find in, as being members of the church is when people are coming in, when people from the community are coming in, maybe people that we know uh, by other means, whether it be work or just neighbors, are coming into this body of people, that are coming into this body of believers, this family, and are diligently seeking, trying to find truth, knowing that we have it, knowing that God has given us truth and understanding through Scripture, we've got to be that friend. We've got to put that arm around them and guide them to Scripture. Take that tender heart that is willing to pursue God and help continue to press them on their way the way that Barnabas did. When it's a brother or sister in the faith, someone that's already committed 
to the work of God. Somebody that's already pursuing heaven and we see them begin to stumble. We see the toils of life begin to take their toll on someone. It's time to put that arm around them and it's time to be that Barnabas. It's time to be the friend that they so desperately need. To be the brother or the sister that they so desperately need in this family. We have an obligation one to another. We are not Christians that happen to meet in a single location. We are not just a product of circumstance, but we are driven by the blood of Christ to pursue heaven in unity through faith and to act as a singular family. A singular family in this place and a singular family globally as we look at the way that the church functions together. We've been given a network, but we have to be willing to work for that to put our efforts and our talents together and to, to shore up the faith. Putting arm in arm around each other and being a friend to those in need. And Jesus describes to us what the ultimate outcome of this work will be if we choose to either go about the business of being that friend or if we choose to deny that work. If you turn over to Matthew 25, as Jesus is describing the way that our work presents itself in the end, in Matthew 25, Beginning in verse 34, it says, And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. This is what Jesus is calling out to us from Scripture. That the way that we treat one another, the way that we choose to interact within the family of God and treat those brothers of His, those fellow heirs, that is indicative directly of how we treat Him. We have to understand that this is not something that is just an ideal state. This ought to be the reality. That we are desperately seeking to be there for those in need. And He continues. And He says, And then He will say to those on the left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of these, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We have an obligation that when we see spiritual hunger, spiritual sickness, that we go out and we seek to provide what those people need, the spiritual nourishment of the world. Then when we see a brother or sister desperately struggling through times of trial, whatever that may be, that we are there to put an arm around them and we are there to help push them on. And we're able to do that because of one simple thing. We strive together towards a common goal. We can be a friend to those in need because we strive together towards a common goal. If you turn with me to Hebrews, the third chapter, In the third chapter of Hebrews, the author gives us, beginning in verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you, and there, there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. This is what we've been charged with. We are that friend because of this. 
because we have a unifying bond that extends beyond any other relationship, any other binding factor that we encounter in this life. That we are pursuing something beyond this life. That we are pursuing something greater. And that we together can be encouraging one another day after day. It's an interesting idea. If we reflect on our own lives, if we reflect on the way that we engage with our brothers and sisters in Christ, do we walk away from that reflection saying that, you know what, each and every day I do everything that I possibly can to make sure that I am encouraging them to continue pressing on towards heaven. That my behavior is setting a standard. That my behavior is encouraging. I'm not talking about berating somebody. I'm talking about encouraging them and lifting them up that I'm helping to push them towards heaven as best I can. And when I look around at my brothers and sisters, I understand the value of the family that God has given me because I can see them pressing me onward too. That we are working in unison towards that ultimate goal of heaven. This is what we have to be pressing towards. This is what we have to be striving for. This is why God has given us this family. You know, Paul continues this, talking about this idea. If you turn over to Ephesians... In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks there, beginning in verse 1. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of you, but to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We have an obligation to do exactly as Paul is speaking of here, to walk in a manner worthy of that calling. Worthy of that calling. It's an interesting idea to think of, of behaving in such a way that you would be worthy of what God has done for us. Worthy of the sacrifice of Christ, worthy of the opportunity of heaven. The idea is that that is a standard that requires continual striving. That is a standard that requires a family of believers to continually be pushing onward, both personally and collectively, working day after day to show that we are going to continually be encouraging one another, continually be pressing on, hoping to achieve that perfect unity, becoming that one body, unified by the singular revelation of the Spirit, holding fast to that one faith, because we have all given ourselves over to God through that one baptism. We are to be in a unified striving, because we are striving for the exact same thing. And what is that? We're striving for what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9. In 1 Corinthians 9, as he speaks to the brothers there, he's continuing this discourse on Christian conduct. In 1 Corinthians 9 and in verse 24, we're told, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way so that you might win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified. We're running after that imperishable crown. And that race requires self-control. That race requires work. That race requires an intense daily training. A training that we can get through if we're able to lean on one another. If we're able to look around and see that those around us, though they face their own trials, though they face their own struggles, that we are all pressing on in pursuit of that ultimate hope of heaven. That's the beauty of this family. Is that we know that no matter what happens outside of this body, outside of the faith that no matter what we can lean on one another because we are all looking to Christ because we're all looking for that crown that is why God has given us this family 
It's so that we can have a friend in times of need. Friends that are continuing to strive towards a common goal. And also, because even beyond that striving, that we actively push each other to be better. And at this point, we can start to get a little uncomfortable because we go over to Galatians 6. And in Galatians 6, what we find is that we have an obligation to look at one another, to look at each other's lives as, as well as our own, and to continue to look out for the spiritual interests of our brothers and sisters. In Galatians 6, in verse 1, as Paul writes there, we're told, Brethren, even if anything is caught in any even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We have an obligation to look out for one another. Plain and simple. We can choose to go through our walk as Christians with others coming to us and saying, you know, I'm concerned about you, I'm concerned about these actions. We can choose to puff up our chests, to become prideful and angry, or we can understand that what we have in front of us is a brother or sister in Christ who's looking at Galatians 6, trying to come to us in a spirit of gentleness, after having looked at themselves, then looking out for one another and trying to help us get to heaven. The other side of that coin as we sit and we look out at our brothers and sisters in Christ, first let us look at ourselves. First let us understand that I have looked at myself and I have understood that I am diligently continuing to seek the path that Christ has laid before me. Continuing to seek heaven and after having done that through a spirit of gentleness, I can look to a brother or sister and say that I am coming to you because I love you. I deeply care about you. And I want nothing more than to see you in heaven someday. And because of that, I'm asking you to look at this in your life. This is what we have to be willing to do. You know, I once heard it put that the best thing you can compare a church to is a hospital. And that's simply because it's for people that are sick. So often we want to walk through those doors and we want to pretend that we are some type of righteous elite, that we are some type of people that are incapable of stumbling or falling and if we do it should be something that is hidden and if it's something that is pointed out it's, we should become bristly and we should just try to shove everyone away we have been given a place where we can come and we can confess our sins because we understand that we are all human and fall short of the glory of God what Romans 3 and 23 talks about and because we understand that the wages of the sin that wages of sin is death as Romans 6 23 talks about we understand that we have a dire need to come to this place and to say, I am struggling, someone help me. I am struggling, someone take me to scripture and show me, show me how to get through this. That's why we're here. And we have to be willing to both give and receive correction from our Christian family. We have to be willing to do this. There is no room for pride in a family. But there can be room for gentle and caring correction because we desperately need it. Paul continues to talk about this. If you turn over to 2 Timothy, as he speaks to the young preacher there, in chapter 2, he begins in verse 24 saying, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. We have an obligation as bondservants of God. We're not here to fight. We're not here to quarrel. We're not here to puff up our chest and boast pridefully when wrong. But instead, we're here through gentleness and teaching and correction to continually do exactly what we talked about and pursue that goal of heaven. You know, we're a family. Physical families don't often handle correction the right way. Sam and I have spent years correcting each other the wrong way, trust me. But it's one of those things where as a Christian family, it's through gentleness that we are supposed to go to one another and say, I'm not coming to you because I want to put you down 
because I want to show that I am better than you. I am coming to you because I care deeply about your soul and because if I was doing something wrong, which someday I very well may be, I expect you to be there on that day, pointing me back towards the path that Christ has given us. It's time to forget about pride and the family of God and start understanding that we are all fallible, that we all fall short at times, but that is why we have each other. And that when someone comes to us or when we go to someone, that there should be a spirit of gentleness and love and respect between us because we understand why God has given us each other. And it's exactly that. God has blessed us with one another. And what does this look like? We're given an example in the book of Acts in chapter 18, exactly what this looks like when it's carried out the way that God intends. In Acts 18, beginning in verse 24, we're given a picture of a young man who needed correction. Beginning in verse 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogues. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he, gra he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. What we're shown here is the young man Apollos, as he begins his walk with God, going out and wanting to speak mightily of the scriptures. And we're even told that he speaks accurately of Jesus, but there was a problem. Being only acquainted with the baptism of John. His knowledge was incomplete. He wanted to go about the work. He wanted to help, each other, help one another strive towards that goal. He wanted to be in the middle of it. And yet, Priscilla and Aquila looking upon him and seeing this shortcoming in his knowledge go to him and they berate him and they put him down and they mock him for that lack of knowledge, right? No. What we're told instead is that as they take him aside, that they take him aside and they explain to him the way of God more accurately and after this, after having explain, explained to him the word of God more accurately, he then goes across, and we're told what? That he greatly helps those who had believed through grace. These moments, these teachable moments in someone's faith, when they're that person in need, those can be make or break moments for someone. Those can be make or break moments for an individual's faith. But what we have to understand is that we have an obligation to push each other but to push each other in the right way. The way that Priscilla and Aquila did. Understanding the benefit that he could be and putting that arm around him. The same way that Barnabas put an arm around Paul and giving him exactly what he needed in order to be successful in the work for God. This is what we ought to be. We're supposed to be a Christian family. We're not a club. We don't just happen to be people of a like-minded understanding of the world. We don't happen to just share the same worldview. But we are people that have been unified through the blood of Christ. We are people that have been driven to pursue God because we opened up our hearts and looked to Scripture and we understood what God has given us, believing in that, believing that Jesus was the Son of God who came to this world and died on that cross for our sins, believing that we were willing to confess in front of others that Jesus was that Christ. Understanding that we had sin in our lives, we were willing to say that, you know what, I want to repent of those sins. And repenting of those sins, we went down into those waters of baptism, and we came out of them a new person. We came out of them no longer being part of no nation. No longer not being a people, but instead being the people of God. Linked forevermore to each and every person who has made that same commitment. Because it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter how we were raised. All that matters is that from that point when we come out of those waters, it's about where we're going. And we should all be going to the same place. We have an opportunity starting today to continue to press on as a unified family. The family here at Danville, the family in other places, and the unified family that spreads this globe 
that gives us a connection to individuals that we would never have otherwise. But God understands that we need each other. And that's why we're here. And yet, even with this family, this network that God has given us, at times, we fall short. We distance ourselves. We take our eyes off heaven. And all of a sudden, we quit pressing on towards those goals. We no longer are taking correction. And we find ourselves off the path. We find ourselves no longer walking each and every day towards eternal life with God. But today, right now, is an opportunity to change that. Right now is an opportunity to look around at the believers sitting to your right and left and understand that each and every person in this room wants you to be with them in heaven. And that is, there is nothing that would bring these people more joy and that would bring God more joy than for you to turn back to God this morning. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never become a part of the family of God. You've never gone down into those waters of baptism and come up a part of that new nation, that new people. This morning is an opportunity to change that. This morning, through that confession, through the repentance and acknowledgement of sin and that belief, you can go down to those waters and you can be raised to walk in newness of life. So whether it be joining that family or returning to it, you have an opportunity this morning. And it is not something to be ashamed of, but it is something that we can fix right now. We have an opportunity to press on towards heaven. We've all been there. And we've put aside pride and we're pursuing God. Let us put aside this world and pursue God together this morning. If there's any way in which we can assist you, please come forward as we stand and sing. Have you?